Is that okay? Hello, Mrs. Rees, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Okay. Good. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Explorers of Anthropocene, we have the honor to have an art historian, incredible art historian, Julie Rees, who is uh, here at uh, the Museo de la Chente, uh, has been here since uh, 9 o'clock uh, in the morning because uh, she's participating in a project which is called uh, We Are the Flood, together with uh, uh, Mr. Cargo. And uh, we want to explore the intersection between uh, uh, creativity, uh, relations with the society, uh, science, art, and Anthropocene. Anthropocene as an important time in human history where the actions of human beings um, have such an impact uh, on our planet uh, as to characterize uh, this uh, era at a geological uh, level. And this is something unprecedented because no other species apart from Homo sapiens was able to change their society in such a critical way as to threaten our own life as we know it. As a Mose, we have received uh, the data that uh, are telling us uh, that the time to change uh, direction in the management uh, of our time is very short. Uh, people speak about 10, 15 years. So as uh, uh, Muse, we uh, want to uh, get in touch uh, with the society in order to do something more uh, as compared to what has been done so far. So we have seen that uh, by telling uh, climate changes uh, and by uh, telling uh, biodiversity changes uh, based on uh, uh, scientific uh, data, based on sensors, uh, well, that was not enough. And this is something that uh, has been doing uh, for a long period uh, since the 50s and the 60s, but this uh, has not helped uh, stop uh, this uh, a process uh, uh, of uh, um, severe change in the planet. So we want to tell uh, what is uh, happening, not only based on science, but also involving other disciplines that uh, we're doing that. And uh, we have this project now, We Are the Flood, uh, curated by uh, Mr. Cargo. Artists are among the most sensitive people in the society. And uh, they are with us. Uh, they are working on this uh, planet uh, emergency. And they are working hard on this topic. So we don't want to uh, leave them alone in this uh, narration, in this uh, storytelling. And so we uh, have decided to get together and launch a hybrid uh, project, uh, including uh, contemporary arts and science. We called it We Are the Flood to give you an idea of the force and the strength uh, that you can mobilize uh, when uh, you uh, get together with other people. So we are stronger. We can do something together. And uh, 
The idea is that uh, of uh, uh, s creating a connection between uh, artists uh, and scientists. And here we have uh, Julie Riz, an art historian who for 10 years uh, has been noting this uh, situation and has been uh, working on that. And since uh, 9 o'clock in the, this morning, together with sociologists, uh, scholars, uh, well, we have been uh, in a room upstairs uh, where we are uh, focusing on these issues and we will continue also tomorrow morning. But we wanted to have a, 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 the possibility of uh, uh, having uh, an open debate an open session uh, um, open to the public uh, and uh, this morning she was uh, really extraordinary she told us she told us uh, some things uh, which are happening out of Europe uh, out of Italy well sorry I didn't uh, present myself my name is uh, Carlo Maiorini I am a, a mediator of uh, Muse I would like to convey to you the greetings of Massimo Bernardi who unfortunately cannot be with us uh, for family reasons And um, before giving the floor to the curator of uh, We Are the Flood, I would like to thank the partners uh, who made this uh, project uh, possible. Uh, and you can see them uh, here listed. So now the floor to Stefano Cagol. Thank you, Carlo. Well, it's very interesting because uh, We Are the Flood has this uh, double meaning. So we are the flood, uh, meaning that we are destructive, uh, but we can also be a, a favorable uh, flood. Uh, so, no, we will now see what uh, has uh, happened uh, so far. This is uh, Jenner Lawrence, uh, uh, an Australian uh, uh, artist. Uh, Uh, it's called the Requiem, and uh, that was uh, done after the fires uh, in Australia. We also have music. So let's imagine the impact uh, of uh, such uh, situations. We cannot but uh, understand uh, the impact uh, of these uh, situations. This is uh, Shabat uh, Amarkul, if we understood correctly, Kizikistan. And here we have uh, eagles uh, uh, who are, which are sort of supported uh, by man. And these are all artists uh, who shared uh, their works. Uh, here we are in Europe where Hans de Beck shows what Anthropocene means. So as we can uh, draw uh, the world uh, with our uh, hands, as if it were um, something that we can manipulate. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, representation. Hans de Beck is uh, an internationally renowned uh, artist. Uh, this is uh, Giacomo Segantini a young uh, artist who uh, had the opportunity to uh, show this uh, uh, situation. You see the spectacularization of fire and CO2. This is Sara Marcus, uh, an Israeli artist. Uh, and here we have a man covered with uh, bread. So there are many uh, connections with the idea of uh, uh, overheating. So there are artists who are coming from throughout the world. Gianno Ampudia from Spain, Concierto para el Bioceno. This is very interesting because the Biocene, uh, juxtaposed to the Anthropocene, is the idea of a world where we play a concert for plants, for nature. I remember this was done during COVID. Is that right? Yes. Yes, 
Um, this is another Spanish artist, Elena Lawes. Pattern of dissolution. This is a mixture of oil, coal, and gold. These are the three things that rule the world. We are willing to give up anything for this mix of materials, of raw materials that have such a strong impact on all of us. So much so that this becomes something hypnotical. And this is Nazakete Tichi, a Turkish German artist. And this is Ledro, the Palafits, the houses on stilts. And it is a specific project that was done on the site with a specific performance made by the artist with this contemporary stilt that recalls the idea of the stilts of the houses on stilts that can still be found in Lidra. There are thousands of these stilts. And as you can see, here's the artist who is suffering. She is Mabrina Abramovic's disciple. She uses her body and she has freed this contemporary stilt of all what was covering it, and she is releasing it in the lake. This part of the performance has taken place only a few days ago. And now we have Julie Riss with her conceptual research. And she will talk about many artists and many different experiences. So now you can see many other pictures of artists almost to Pia, PSJ, um, this is a collective of artists of the Canary Islands. Sasha can now working with seaweed. And many others. Mikko Grazioli, Giulianelli, Sasha Canà, Fabio Marullo, Barbara De Ponti. This is the presentation of the first exhibition made at the Albere. These are very quick, extemporary exhibitions. So We Are the Flood now introduces Julie Riss, who has flown here directly from New York, to tell us important and significant things regarding our stance, our world, our future. The problem is the fact that we are no longer symbiotic with nature. We are competing with nature. We take a distance from nature, but we try to reconnect with nature. And the very special thing about all of this is that we are in a museum of sciences, and that's the very DNA of where the flood, the interaction between art that can create new images to communicate complex concepts that are sometimes difficult to understand because global warming, for instance, is something that envelopes us, but it is not always perceivable because, okay, we can say the climate is changing, but we don't really understand because we are right in the middle of it. And through art, it is actually possible to communicate a new imaginary world to aim for a better future, a more interesting future, a hope for the future. So welcome to Julie Rees, who's going to talk right now. Thank you very much and welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I first would like to say thank you to my hosts here. Uh, to Stefano for inviting me to come to Trento, and for Carlo, who has been so helpful and contributed all day a very important scientific perspective uh, to the art that I was talking about. I am a historian of art, and I have never presented in a science museum before, but I think for this topic, this is a wonderful setting for uh, for this presentation and just being here in the same building with dinosaurs and fish and 
rocks uh, really adds some urgency to the discussion of the state of the planet, the crisis that we find ourselves in. Um, so I guess I'm going to ask someone to move the, there we go. So as I said, I am a historian of modern and contemporary art, but um, about 10 years ago, I began to notice that artists were making art about climate change. And I was very concerned about climate change, but I did not see how it connected to being an art historian. And it was the artists that showed me what the connection was. I followed their lead uh, and began to find more and more art that uh, addressed the issues that we are facing in the ecological crisis today. Uh, in 2019, I edited an anthology, Art Theory and Practice in the Anthropocene. I wanted to have lots of different people writing for the book. I had a, a graduate student, I had an art critic, I had a, uh, an artist. I think it's very important right now to hear from a lot of different perspectives. This is everybody's world and uh, we all need to have our voices heard. For the cover of the book, I asked I, my friend, the artist uh, Justin Bryce, to let me use a photograph of his arm. And you can see that on his arm, there's a jagged black line. And that line is the rate at which the temperature has been rising on the planet since 1880. And he could find on it and show you when his grandfather was born, when his father was born, when he was born. Uh, but he felt it was very important to have this on his body because the idea of, of we are the flood, that we have to take responsibility for the situation right now is, is something that, that uh, Justin Bryce agrees with. And so he, he embodies it. Now, if you look at the outstretched arm, a man's arm outstretched, it might remind you of a cultural icon. If I can have the next one. Uh, also, when I saw his arm, I thought about the creation of Adam. And this famous image of the arms of two men who are meeting. And the meaning in 1508, when Michelangelo made the creation of Adam, of all the good things that man was going to bring, this gift of life and this uh, adventure that was going to begin. Uh, but then somehow from there, we get to this very different place, the Anthropocene, and that wasn't really going to be part of the plan. If I could have the next one. The next slide, yeah. So. This one, which has been the uh, picture that we used to tell people about the event, um, I think is a, a good example of the, uh, the need to come together uh, in a general way uh, and get rid of all different barriers uh, and understand that this is one planet. Uh, to make this work, uh, Julian Charrier, who's a, a Swiss artist, uh, took lots of different globes from different times in history. And then he collected sand from beaches from all over the world. And he used that sand to sand away all of the boundaries and lines on all of the globes. So all the different versions of how we understood the earth and the national boundaries and the borders from different eras, all of it off. And so now you have just the naked planet a, a ball flying through the air. And he calls the work, we are all astronauts because we are all flying through space. Every one of us, we don't think about it. It all seems so stable and still, but we are flying through space on the same planet. And he wanted to show that. And this is, I think, a work for the Anthropocene for a time where we have to think about how uh, humankind has changed the planet and uh, what we need to do to go forward. If I could have the next one. And this one, uh, which is one of uh, Stefano's, 
the art that we are talking about tonight does not have to be uh, specific to a time or a place or even a single environmental issue. Sometimes the art is. The, the artists are making art about the loss of biodiversity or the rise of sea levels. I like this one because this is a call to action and it really conveys the urgency that we all need to be feeling uh, in order to try to help solve the, the problems that are, uh, that are facing us. And it just speaks to uh, sounding the alarm. And that's something that scientists have been trying to do for a very long time. And uh, people are not always uh, listening. Uh, where I come from in the USA, uh, many people are not listening. Uh, so it's good to look at a work like this and just think about the, uh, the urgent call to action that it suggests. Can okay, I the next one? So okay, these are two very different artworks, and I just will take a quick couple of minutes and tell you about both of them. One of the ways that art can be helpful right now is in bringing people together to make them aware that we all share a lot of the same difficulties. Nele Asavito creates minimum monument in many different cities. She will take 1,000 little people made out of ice and put them on the steps of a public building so that everybody can see them. They melt very quickly. If you see this one, there are already some little puddles where some of the people have melted. Uh, and the people all look the same, and it can be understood as a reminder of the fragility of the surface and base ice on the planet, and also how vulnerable we are if the temperatures rise. Uh, some people will melt before others, if you want to be literal here. But it also is a, a hopeful piece, because in order to create it, people have to work together. The little, the little ice people are so small that if you have only one person putting them out, though half of them will be melted before you get the other half up. So people volunteer in the different cities where this project is to help place the little people. And in doing that, they work together and they come together around this issue of, of melting ice. The artist on the other side lives in Miami, Florida which is the city in the United States that is the most vulnerable to rising sea levels. I'm sure you've heard in the news about Florida in general, uh, Hurricane Ian. Uh, Florida just sticks right out there with the ocean on one side and the Gulf of Mexico on the other. And Miami uh, is very, very low uh, to the sea. Xavier Cortada decided to create an underwater HOA. In the United States, an HOA stands for Homeowners Association. And in different neighborhoods, people create HOAs so they can come together as a neighborhood around problems that are facing everybody in that neighborhood. So he created an underwater homeowners association. And people agreed to have a sign in front of their house with a number on it. And the number says, the number of feet that the water would rise before that house is underwater. And you can see across the way your neighbor has the same sign. Or maybe your neighbor's sign says six feet. Their house is even lower than yours. But now, instead of coming together around other neighborhood issues, or instead of being divided because the sign in front of your house has the name of a different politician, than the sign in front of your neighbor's house. Now everybody can see that they are in the same situation. And this is something that art can do because it can make a problem visible. And once it's visible, people can come and talk about it. It gives people a place to come and have those conversations. So this looks very simple, a number eight in front of someone's house, but it's part of a community project uh, that I think has been a very important one. Next one, please. Uh, we were talking today in the class that I'm teaching here about artists who try to find actual solutions to uh, 
uh, ecological problems. And people don't think that artists are those people who will do that. Uh, but here are, are two projects uh, where that happened. Both of them have been done with artists and scientists together. The revival field uh, shows how plants can absorb toxic chemicals from the earth. The artist, Mel Chin, had the idea to try out testing different plants to see which ones were most effective. And he approached a scientist who had been also interested in the same thing, but could not get the research going. There was so much bureaucracy and, and he could not convince people to do the project. But the artist could convince people to do this as an art project. Um, and so the artist got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And together, the scientists and the artists tested out this idea and learned that one of those plants was really good at absorbing toxic material from the, the ground. By 2003 in the United States, this has, had become a very common way to try to take toxins out of the soil. But it began as a small project that an artist wanted to do. On the other side, you see something by Mary Mattingly. She's coming here in December to do a residency, and you should all come back to see whatever she did, because she's amazing and I think is a wonderful combination of telling you what the problems are, doing the research, and then offering you an optimistic solution. Um, in this case, she put a, a dome in the uh, big park in Brooklyn. Uh, it's called Prospect Park. And inside the dome were native plants, plants that grow all along the watershed that brings water from the state of New York down, down, down to the city of New York. And people in New York never think about where their water comes from. But in fact, uh, New York has a very unusual and very uh, fragile but uh, wonderful water supply. The water is not filtered. There are so many plants along the watershed that filter the water. So it comes down from the, the mountains at the top of the state and it goes through lots and lots of different paths until it comes in and then uh, we drink it. And New Yorkers are very proud of our water. But it's a fragile system. People who live along the watershed, uh, they can't go in the water, they can't touch the water. And the city is always having to convince them to stay away, to protect the water. But there's not always a good relationship between what we call upstate New York and downstate New York. But Mary made this project um, and taught people who live downstate where their water comes from and why they should respect the whole watershed. The dome is open at the top and rain comes in and it goes through and it gets filtered through all the plants and at the bottom there's a little spout with a cup and you can have a drink so that you can actually watch the process of water filtration. But it's an art project. She is an artist and the work was sponsored by the Department of Parks and Recreation, the Public Art Fund, the New York City Department of Water, the State Water Department. A lot of different organizations helped to make this project happen and see what at all the people who are standing around it. It becomes a place to get information. People are attracted to it because it looked in the park like a beautiful bubble of rain. Uh, and then when they get close, there are all of these plants inside. So now they're talking about plants and now they're learning about plants. So that's something that uh, an artist can, can do uh, to put something in a public space that way. Can I have the next one, please? Um, the artists are not always uh, making artwork with ecological problems in mind. Uh, there should be a date on this one. I left it off. But this was made in 2006, and that's early. In 2006, there was not so much art about uh, all the sea level rise and deforestation and so on. But what was interesting about this work was that the artists used plastic cups 
What you see on the one side is a detail. Now you can tell that these are the plastic cups that people use every day. And she made them into a kind of sea or a cloud of plastic cups. And even without uh, knowing how much plastic is in the ocean or how we should stop using plastic, there's an uneasy feeling that there are too many cups here. It just feels bad to look at the work. It's beautiful in a way, and then you get up close and you think, oh, plastic cups, they never go away. They're here forever. Uh, so sometimes the artist can just make a shape, and something in that shape tells you something important about consumption and over-consumerism. And um, now, especially in 2022, we look at this work and it seems prophetic of what is going to happen uh, later. Next one, please. Uh, in a way, there's something similar here because this artist, El Anatsui, um, who uh, works in Ghana, he's from Nigeria, was also using garbage, trash, uh, fairly early on in 2007. He was in the Venice Biennale, and it was the introduction of contemporary art from uh, Africa in the Venice Biennale. Uh, and it was the beginning of something that uh, made El Anatsui a worldwide uh, famous artist. Uh, in Ghana, where he has a workshop, he weaves together the metal tops from bottles. And these are bottles of generally alcohol, uh, liquor, that have come to Africa uh, from the West, uh, from England or from the United States. And it, there ends up being a tremendous amount of waste afterward. And at first, Elinatsby was interested just in the material. It was flexible, but very strong. And then he began to weave. In Ghana, there's a great tradition of weaving. And he used some of those traditions to make these large sheets all made up of those little uh, metal tops. So that again, you see it at first and you think, oh, that's, that's beautiful. And then you look closely and you think, oh, there, are so, there is so much garbage in this world. And I think an artist can do both of those things, can draw you in and then you see what it is. And then it helps you to understand that message in a different way than if you read about it in the newspaper. Next one. I know I need to move a little faster. Once I begin talking about these things, there's a lot to say. Just briefly, artists can show you that we need to make a stronger connection with the natural world, that we have become uh, too separate. We don't understand our dependence on the natural world, and we don't understand how every system on the planet is interdependent. And this is an artist who has tried to get closer to the ocean. That is her in both pictures. Um, she has gone to aquariums and tried to communicate with the sea lions, as you can see here. And in the other one, she's just trying to embrace the ocean. She just, she wants to uh, connect with it. Next one. Uh, both of these uh, show a way that we can become less uh, centered as humans and can move over and make a little more space for, uh, for nature. Uh, on the left side is a 30 meter long uh, photogram. So a piece of photographic paper was laid out in the rainforest in Peru. And by moonlight, the patterns of the the trees in the rainforest made an imprint on the, the paper. So there was no human and there was no camera involved. The rainforest, in a way, took its own picture. And then the artist developed the picture in water from the river that was also right there. So it's as much as possible a photograph that human beings did not create uh, of nature. Um, and on the other side, the artist Jenny Kendler uh, it's a, a, a play on words. In America, we say, oh, people like to be bird watchers. There are whole groups and associations for bird watching. They, just, they take their binoculars and they walk outside and look for birds. 
but this is not bird watching, this is birds watching. So now the birds are looking at you, they are doing the watching. And this, these are the eyes of 100 different birds, uh, all in proportion to the right scale. And all of these birds are on the endangered species list. And Jenny Kendler wanted us to have the experience of looking into the eyes of those birds and maybe then understanding that we have some responsibility, that they are reminding us of our responsibility to them. And just looking at these two works and you see how completely different there are, they are. There's not one way that this is happening. And something might be more interesting to one person and something more interesting to another. Um, but it's, I think um, it's very creative to see that range. Next one. I have just, just two more I want to show you. Um, there's been so much talk in the USA, but I know also in Europe, about monuments. What should a monument be? Who should we admire? Who should be permanently uh, made out of, of bronze or another metal so that it's always there? This one is study for a monument. So we think, okay, it's not finished. But it's a monument to, uh, to plants, to certain plants that are in the marshlands uh, in Iraq. After the Iraq war, Saddam Hussein set the marshlands on fire because there were people hiding in the marshlands who had resisted him. And in doing that, he killed a tremendous amount of plants and also forced all the people who normally lived in the marsh to have to leave. And so this is a monument to that destruction. The bronze plants are laid out on a sheet the way you might see uh, bodies laid out on a sheet. But it's not the people. The plants are standing in. They are representing the people. But they are also representing the ecological damage of warfare. We don't always remember that that also destroys uh, the land. Um, and the next one. So the... The next and last one I'm showing you uh, is very nonspecific. The big picture is a detail of the smaller one because the smaller one does not have uh, very good resolution. This was in the Venice Biennale. There was a small satellite exhibition called Planet B that was all uh, art that indirectly referred to climate change. And I wanted to finish with this because one of the uh, important functions for art is just to reflect back to us what it feels like to be in the world right now. Maybe not for a specific problem or a specific reason, but just this strange landscape that we inhabit, the unnatural color of the sky. I think about how in San Francisco last year, the sky was orange. It, it, everyone looked out the window and for almost a week the sky was the wrong color. Uh, this strange things we don't understand, machines we don't understand, uh, giving off steam, we don't know why, that just something of that uneasiness um, I think can just capture in a general way uh, what, what it feels like. And now I will finish by putting up the last one, which maybe we'll all talk about. Can I have the last one? Uh, which has to do with the recent trend of throwing food at artwork. <laughs> For me as an art historian, this is very hard. <laughs> anyway, thank you. So now we'll have some conversation. Grazie, Julie. Thank you very much, Julie. I mean, we've just seen a series of very different works, all by well-known artists, some exposing at the Biennale, Armory Show, Documenta. I mean, we're talking about the apex of a global research which has actually taken root in the last few years. Very interesting is the concept of young people who, to draw attention, they just go to museums and 
use ancient art to attract attention for an important problem. So that frustration brings them to this kind of activity, which so far uh, is still quite a soft type of activity because they don't aim at really damaging the work of art, but they attract the media. And it is a facet of the fact that art with ideas and intelligence is trying to make people understand that we have to resolve problems. Uh, we do this in a slower way without resorting to terrorism, but there is some sense of urgency. And this is why Musa decided to organize this event. I mean, we have no time. Things are changing so quickly, much more quickly than we can imagine. Things are changing fast, and these young people have understood that. So the dilemma is, should we preserve art? Why should we preserve Van Gogh in 100 years? Maybe the museum itself will no longer exist. So what's the purpose of this? Carla, would you like to take the floor and speak as a person who works in a museum? How do you see this? Sure. Well, let me start with the Anthropocene program. In our master class documentation, we had a very important article by Massimo Bernardi, who should have sat here in my place this evening, uh, talking about the role of museums in the Anthropocene. Uh, this was done for ICON, the most important association of international museums. So already two years ago, Massimo wrote, museums are running the risk of losing their meaning for new generations who somehow have understood our message uh, because that group of activists who threw potato puree on Monet's painting in Potsdam, I think, uh, because we got bolognese sauce and mashed potatoes. Yes, this is happening on a daily basis. Klimt in Vienna. Yeah, there are several groups. Um, that group was called ultimate or last generation. So, I mean, if your name is last generation, which is the meaning of a museum that aim at preserving our cultural heritage that have the purpose of educating? I mean, the old generation should educate them while the old generation has not managed to preserve the world. So in this article, Massimo Bernardi explores this philosophical crisis and also provides some indications. Projects such as We Are the Flood, as well as many other projects of Muse, are built on Massimo's indications regarding this important question. That is, museums can no longer be sites where things are exhibited behind glass. I mean, mashed potatoes, tomato soup, just clash on that glass wall. There are museums like this one where there is no glass anymore because we no longer want to have a museum for a fraction of our citizens who come and contemplate. A museum must be the site of exchange, where a dialogue is developed regarding several important issues. As a museum of sciences, we have been working hard on sustainability. And we are the flood is no longer a project where we exhibit works of very famous artists. No, it is a project that invites young people to come and get to know what is happening in the world thanks to Professor Rissos. And they 
can make their own attempts, their prototypes, their experiments, and then maybe they'll come back to meet an important artist. So it is a live place where meetings take place, where there is an exchange. Simultaneous to our work today, there was another project experimenting with the structure of plants, how they could illuminate, uh, indicating the variations in the nutrients. I mean, an educational workshop, of course, didactic activities are fundamental. We have been talking about this today as well, the important role of education and didactics. But the museum must be an activist as well. Julie showed us an artist this morning, correct me if I'm wrong, an artist. I mean, there was a problem of water exploitation in an area of America where an artist involved the whole community, the whole local community, and built his work of art, which was a sh several shields with a reflecting surface, so that the police that was trying to enforce their land grabbing activities uh, was actually recognized as an aggressor. So this was a work of art. So the artist involved the community in the museum to produce these shields, since many of them were needed. And in the end, there was this amazing wall of mirrors that was incredibly powerful. So the museum is also a place where you go and build your own shields to safeguard your right to water. Well, most likely, activism is a term that has no logical meaning anymore. We should all be activists. Activism should be our new normality. That should be our general attitude. Regarding the European agenda and formally political in Europe, activism is actually normality. They're very precise messages regarding what we should do, also in terms of CO2 reduction, and also the European Kunsthalle, the new Bauhaus, actually puts art at the center. This is still a little bit abstract, I believe, but here we are already having our European Kunsthalle. Julie, would you like to add anything? Um, no, only that we discovered today that in the United States, we are having some of the same discussions about the role of the museum and the continued relevance of the museum. Um, in uh, the museums in New York, the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, the major museums there, uh, they have changed who they, uh, what art they hang on the walls because people still want art on the walls, but they want the art of other people than they are accustomed to seeing. Um, during the pandemic, during the Black Lives Matter protests, which was a whole summer every day of protests on the street, uh, there was pressure put on museums, which was right. It was good to have that pressure. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum completely rehung their galleries with art by uh, indigenous artists who live in America and black and Latino artists who live in America. And it turned out they had always owned those artworks. If you look at when they were acquired, they didn't run out and buy new ones, but they had not hung them on the walls. Now they're on the walls, all. They went from, from none to only, right? It's a completely different museum in the contemporary art area. And we say better late than never. So another way that museums do stay relevant is that you can change what you hang and you can also change what you say about it. Today in the class, we were talking about 19th century American landscape painting, which often was done to show people who live in the East what the West looked like 
People hadn't been out there yet. They didn't know what the Rocky Mountains looked like or California. Um, and these paintings are very grand and very magnificent, but they also don't really have anybody, uh, any people in them. Usually it looks like there, there's, it's, it's empty. And it wasn't empty. There were lots of people living there, but it was more convenient to say, you can take this, look, there's nothing there. Right? So now those paintings are hanging on the wall, but there's a different label next to them. And so that's an important role that a museum can play, is to revise the way we understand culture. We don't have to say there's no point keeping it. We have to say, what can we learn from this? What new ideas, new questions, new words do we have that we can read back into the history of art? and understand. And I think that is one reason why it's sad to me that the activists now uh, are, have, have so much contempt for the older artwork. There's always something that you can learn, um, even about landscape, about uh, gardens, about uh, how people regarded nature then, uh, and how we regard nature now. You can put art in dialogue, older art and newer art. We looked at some of that today too. Um, so I think in an art museum, there are many ways to stay uh, relevant. Uh, and to me, a science museum is so important right now because so many people have stopped trusting science. So you need to have, be able to have a place where people know that they're getting the actual information. And ideally, artists and scientists uh, work together to support each other's work. And those kinds of collaborations uh, can be uh, exhibited in a science museum or an art museum. So the museum has a, a lot of good stuff still to do. That's right. The fundamental thing that emerged when I was debating with Massimo Bernardi, paleontologist and director of the Anthropocene program uh, in Lugano, uh, we were talking about art and science and art can actually support science. Also, in replacing schemes, graphs, tables, I mean, poor art can support science to decode the message, to decodify it. Yes, because data alone don't work, we've realized that. Yes, and this is probably the central focus of the reason why we are the flood is here in this museum, because there is a shared objective, which is that of communicating what is happening and investigating what is happening, investigating the state of the art and imagining a plausible future with the possibility of changing the future, maybe since at first glance the situation is pretty difficult. I'm rather apocalyptic as a person, but I have, I'm obliged to be positive and it's only right. So a final question for Julie Rees. Well, we are here and we are presenting an experiment which is uh, pretty successful also if we uh, look at the interest uh, shown uh, by young people who uh, want to focus on these uh, issues. Uh, so um, we think that uh, this uh, uh, is a way uh, by which uh, the museum is opening up to society. Would you have any recommendations, any guidelines? Uh, so in an ideal uh, let's say, situation, uh, what could be a possible development of this collaboration between art and science? Um, 
Well, I think there are a, a number of different forms that it is taking and that it will take. In the most extreme, there is a group working in uh, New York right now called Sky High Farm. And they consider themselves an artist collective. Uh, and they are a farm. They grow food. And for them, being an artist is to not produce objects anymore, but to just be out in the world solving a problem and making it possible for other people to uh, come together as a community. So there's a, a part of contemporary art uh, called social practice, which is just putting away the paint and the, the pencil and just being out there in the world as an art project. Uh, and maybe there's a way for science to come out also. You know, uh, because at this point, a lot of people accept that Sky High Farm is an art project. <laughs> um, and and there's, that's it, they, they grow food. So maybe it's to have people lead the way to, uh, to show solutions and maybe very local solutions that are manageable, that can give people hope that in their one area something could be made better. I'll just tell you very quickly, so um, I live near the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. They have a, all the glass houses and plants. They also have a program called Brooklyn Urban Gardeners. Uh, it's it's B-U-G-S, they call them bugs, like ins insecti, bugs. Um, but they come into the program with big ideas about fixing things on a very large scale. And they come out two months later and they have a really good idea to fix a tree that's across the street from their house. They're gonna put a guard around the tree and that's gonna make it better, the tree will be protected. And I think that learning what you can actually manage to do and accomplish is very important. And maybe that's something that artists and scientists could work together on if, to find something that can be solved and the artist maybe has the communication ability to help make that solution happen. Because I'm always amazed by how happy it makes people to actually solve a problem and they don't have to solve a big problem. You know that feeling. If you just solved one little problem one day, that's a good feeling. Uh, and this is so overwhelming, what's happening now, and so big. And it makes people want to shut down. And maybe if artists and scientists could work together to help people to do something so they don't shut down, that would be the, the way it could go. Grazie. Grazie. Quindi, piccola foresta di cibo, qua fuori, magari. So, well, this uh, could be also a guideline for the director of the museum uh, to have this project here. So, thank you so much uh, with your final recommendation. I don't know if Stefano would like to say something. Well, this uh, has been a dialogue on theories and practices uh, for a desirable future. This is the title or the subtitle. Well, the phrase uh, desirable future is very important for me because we have to work uh, uh, for that. Uh, yes. Yes, we have to make plans. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, do you have any question for uh, Julie? Um, I'm getting a lot of static on this headpiece, so I hope I can understand. If not, you can tell me what the question is. Okay. Spero che riusciate a capirmi. Okay, that's better. Can you hear me? Can I you can hear me? Now, okay. I can, now I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Well, it's a point of curiosity. Well. One of the uh, indications for those who deal uh, with the uh, communication on climate changes and all the issues uh, raised by Anthropocene uh, is uh, that of not being uh, too catastrophic uh, because uh, this uh, um, perhaps uh, um, makes people um, unwilling to work because if I say everything is going uh, uh, bad, uh, then uh, people will feel lost. Uh, but 
But this is not the case because there are examples where there are good practices of conservation of nature where species are saved. So many of the examples of art that you showed us were mainly focused on a feeling of fear. Uh, so do you know if there are uh, art uh, currents or movements uh, which are trying to mobilize uh, uh, people to act and react uh, to these uh, threats? I'm not sure I agree with you that the art that I showed was about fear, though. I think the art that I showed is about finding a way to stay with the problem. Um, the problems are... Uh, are difficult, but it's possible to uh, to stay with them. When Jenny Kendler shows you the eyes of 100 birds on the endangered species list, maybe that will help people take more responsibility going forward for birds. She is not showing you a lot of dead birds. She's reminding you that birds have a consciousness also. And I think that the, uh, it's important that people understand the fundamental ideas about how we look at nature and how important human beings see themselves. It's important that people understand that those fundamental ideas have to change and artists can help show the way to change them. Um, but someone like Xavier Cortada who's showing people the, the, the sign with the number in front of their house. This has been a very positive experience because the community has come together. Now they understand that they all have a shared vulnerability and now they are working to elect politicians that are going to help mitigate the sea level rise, they are working together to plant mangrove trees to stop the erosion um, on the, the, on the seawall. So these are calls to action. They are not designed to, uh, to make people feel bad. Uh, Mary Mattingly, I showed you her project of the, the watershed core. There was just a big article about her in the New York Times. And the title of the article was The Optimistic Art of Mary Mattingly. So it's possible that there's a cultural difference between the United States and Italy, but I don't think I showed you anything that was, that was dark. <laughs> Well, I was saying uh, not all of these uh, works, not all of the, those works, uh, oh, just okay. uh, some of them. Some of them. Some okay. of them. Well, they make uh, the problem uh, visible, but I have to say that uh, there is... Uh, not even one uh, uh, work of art uh, which is uh, terrorizing. Perhaps mine is the most uh, uh, apocalyptic, uh, perhaps. <laughs> all in all, they are all very quiet uh, uh, works uh, which uh, uh, let you think about the problems. Uh, so this is my, my feeling, my, my idea. But certainly there are artists who are working within organizations, um, uh, whether it's being an ambassador for climate change at the UN, like the artist Olaf or Eliasson, or working as an artist in residence in a municipal or, or city agency, uh, who they are trying to help bring the message of that agency forward. Um, in a creative way. Um, today we looked at an artist who was the artist in residence for the New York City Department of Sanitation, the people who pick up the garbage. And she did a project where she shook the hand of every single sanitation worker in New York. It was called Touch Sanitation. And it was to connect people with the idea that their garbage doesn't just disappear and go away. Right? that they are also responsible for it and responsible to the people who are dealing with the garbage. Uh, and the pictures just show her every single, she's reaching up to the truck, she's shaking the hands. Um, 
it's also about making things that are invisible visible um, and showing you a different way of, of modeling, a different way of being in the world. Uh, for me, that's uh, as important as solving the problems, as just to model collaboration, model being connected, um, that that's as important as anything else that this art is doing. Yeah, this is exactly the uh, type of uh, communication that we want to have about uh, the uh, environment. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, it should be uh, helpful uh, to uh, recognize the contribution of uh, uh, everybody. So this is uh, a type of thing that only an artist uh, could uh, think about. Uh, and certainly, we need uh, um, integration uh, and uh, inclusion of everybody. So, Stefano, would you like to give us an idea about the future of this uh, project? Uh, well. I'm very uh, uh, happy that we will have uh, Mary Medling from New York. She is uh, one of the most uh, renowned uh, artists uh, in uh, uh, New York. Uh, also, the New York Times uh, has uh, written about Mary. And uh, she will be with us uh, for 10 days uh, in uh, Trento. Uh, she will also invent uh, new installations uh, for uh, the Muse. It will be a very good uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, this year we had two sort of liquid exhibitions, and one here and uh, one uh, in a different place uh, where we had uh, a, an archaeological site uh, which was so chosen for that installation. So contemporary art uh, which dives into the past in order to think of the future. So this is a multi-layer project made by different aspects, also fluid aspects, meaning that we don't know where we will end up. But uh, um, so this is my idea. So please uh, remain with us. Remain with uh, We Are the Flood. Remain with the Muse in order to um, focus about these uh, urgent uh, uh, issues, uh, and we need to face them uh, with uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, so art, uh, science uh, um, can work together. Art and science uh, at a university during the Renaissance uh, were together. They were just one thing, uh, tech med, uh, technicians, uh, and uh, artists. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, indication. Uh, so when you will see some strange things in the gardens of uh, this museum, uh, well, you will uh, know what it is. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, many thanks uh, to Julie Rice. Uh, thanks to Stefano Kagol. Of course, uh, if you have any comment uh, or, or question, we're here. Otherwise, uh, we close and we thank in particular Julie Rice. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.